Hey everybody, uh, welcome uh, back to the channel. Um, I'm out at the sawmill shed today, going to be making some lumber on my sawmill. And um, this morning I was looking through some of the posts on the Woodland Mills Facebook uh, uh, community and uh, noticed somebody asking about how to size the beam in their sawmill shed. And I thought, well, that's a real interesting topic. Uh, I make for a great video because this is something a lot of people want to know about. Um, it's not too complicated. It's kind of interesting. And so I figured it'd be great to, uh, make a video about this. So, uh, I want to get started. I'll flip the camera around. We'll walk around and look at my sawmill shed and talk about how loads propagate down from a roof through rafters and header beams and posts and finally footings and how you might want to do sizing for all of those things. Um, and we'll go inside and, uh, uh, pull out the pen and paper and uh, do some of the calculations you would need to uh, uh, figure things out uh, for your structure. So stay tuned and we'll get started. Okay, here we are looking at the uh, inside of the uh, structure and the framing on my sawmill shed. I have about a 25 foot uh, open span on the front here so that I can get uh, logs in pretty easily. And uh, this is a you know pretty typical span people are going to want for a sawmill shed. Uh, at least on the front or on one side so that they can bring logs in and carry the lumber back uh, off of the mill. So, you know, in a lot of these structures, people are looking at spanning a pretty long distance compared to, um, you know, normal sheds and barns. And so calculations of things like uh, header beams become kind of important. So really, no matter what the structure, though, uh, everything revolves around propagating loads from your roof and the roof structure uh, down through, uh, in this case, we have purlins and then rafters, and then the rafters rest on beams. There's the front, I have two LVL beams. The back, I have uh, six by six rough sawn timbers. Um, and then the beams will transmit or propagate their loads down the posts, and the posts transmit the loads to the footings in the ground. And so when you calculate all of these things, you're really just going through the process of knowing what loads are on the roof and pro propagating them down on through the rest of the structure. You, you can kind of think of these loads as flowing through the structure um, until they get to your final bearing uh, down on your footer. Um, so really, the first step in this process is to decide what materials you're going to use for your roof, what type of framing or sheathing might be involved so you you know generally you might be looking at metal roof on purlins or uh, asphalt roof on osb okay and i like to take the weight of the roofing material um, as a pound per square foot kind of thing multiply it over the area of the roof and that tells me how many pounds of roofing material are going to be pressing down on the roof now, in warm regions, that might be the only load you have to worry about. For those of us that get snow, that's going to be generally a much higher load. Um, you know, normally that's at least four times higher, could be as much as 20, 20 to 50 times higher than the roofing material load. And so the next thing you want to do is to look up the typical snow load for the area you live in, and this information is readily available in building codes uh, online or check with your local building department. They'll tell you, there is, there's gonna be number again in pounds per square foot, PSF, uh, to tell you, you know, what type of snow load you need to plan for. Where I live, we normally use 25 PSF for a snow load. So you're gonna want, want to take that and multiply that by the area of the roof. And that's gonna tell you how much weight will be pressing down on the roof from a heavy snowfall. You'll combine that with the weight of your roofing materials and now you know the total load uh, on your roof and you can start to work that load down through rafters, beams, posts, and, and footings. And so that's kind of the process. Uh, it's pretty straightforward when you think about it. And again, you know, you need to start by understanding what kind of weight is gonna be on the roof what you need to support. Uh, by the way, those are all what we'd consider to be static loads. There are some cases where you want to consider live loads, such as you know what happens when someone's walking around up on the roof, because that creates kind of a dynamic loading. And uh, um, 
there are some cases where you need to plan for that. I normally don't in farm structures. Um, I just overbuild things a little bit, put on a factor safety. And, um, you know, I've crawled around on the roofs of everything I've built. And it's always been clear to me that uh, I, I've i built it uh, stout enough to handle uh, the live loads. And so, so that hasn't been an issue. Uh, but yeah, you know, we really want to start with, uh, for the base calculation, what the static loads are on the roof from snow and the materials and carry that on down through the rest of the structure. So, um, you know, the first step I normally do once I have uh, an idea is I want to figure out what size rafter I need for the given span. And there are tables you can use for that very very common carpentry tables will give you uh, the types of, uh, or the sizes of rafters needed for a given span, and I'll uh, show an example of that uh, when we go inside. Um, and uh, what factors into that also is the spacing of rafters. I tend to do two foot spacing on my farm structures, um, but you know, the more rafters you have, the thinner or the, the, the uh, smaller they can be. The fewer rafters you have, uh, the beefier they're going to need to be. And so there's a usually a balance there depending on cost and, you know, overall amounts of lumber you'll need or the amount of fasteners or the amount of work that you can use to choose a rafter for the given span. But, uh, you know, that that's kind of the process there. Um, take your load, know your span, decide what size rafter you need and what the spacing will be. And then things start to get much easier because now you've got... Uh, that roof load being transmitted uh, down to each rafter and then it's going to rest on your your header beams at these intervals and that's going to give you a basically pounds per foot load down on the header beams and you know that'll be true you know in the back here where I have a post I have half of the span here or in the front here where I do not have a post and it's full span uh, we're going to get basically the amount of that roof load from snow and material that's going to be pressing down on the, the front and back beams. And then we can go to beam tables or beam calculations and we'll get to that when we go inside. And that'll tell us, you know, based on the type of wood we're using, what size we need for those header beams. And that's, that's probably the simplest and easiest of, of all the calculations because uh, there are cookbook formulas for that that uh, take into account how the beams are fastened on the ends, you know, do you have corner braces, things like that. And so it's pretty easy to work out the, the beams. That's the question most people ask. Um, and so we'll look at that uh, when we go inside. Once you've worked out what size beams are needed, then you gotta figure, okay, how many posts do I have? So back here I have one, two, three. Uh, in the front I just have two posts. Well, those posts are now going to carry the load of the entire beam on down to your footing in the ground. And typically we'll put those below the frost line if that's a concern where you live. Or, you know, for a pole barn, you really want these at least two to three feet down in the ground to get good resistance to wind loads, uplift, um, help the structure, you know, be strong and not want to fold over under a heavy, heavy wind load. So... We go down pretty deep for pole barns. I, I go down usually a minimum of 32 inches myself. And um, I did a previous video, I think, on one of my other structures talking about footings. Um, but usually at the bottom of each hole, I will pour four to five inches thick concrete to act as my footing. And uh, the post will sit on that and bear its weight down on the footing, which in turn bears its weight down on the soil. And um, this is kind of maybe the last or the first key step, depending on how you approach this process. You need to know how much weight your soil can support. And again, that's usually something that's given in um, load per area, like pound per square inch or uh, pound per square foot. It's often termed as the soil bearing capacity. And uh, that will tell you basically how big of a footer you need in order for your post load to press down on the soil and not sink in. You know, you might get a little bit of settling, uh, but you don't want it to be sinking dramatically. And, and this is, by the way, the same calculation people would use when building a foundation on a house, uh, when they're pouring a, 
a large footing or putting in foundation walls, they, they take into account, you know, how much is pressing on the soil, what the soil can support, and that tells them how big the footings need to be and, and all kinds of other things. And so um, that's, that's either going to be the last step or the first step, depending how you approach this. There have been some projects where the soil bearing capacity um, determines maybe that I will need an extra post because I can't drill a big enough post hole to have a big enough footer to carry the load of fewer posts. And so this might be something you have to juggle around. You know, what's the soil going to support? How many posts can I put in to take that load? And then you think about the reverse process. Well, now I'm propagating that up through the posts and into the beams and into the rafters and up onto the roof and the snow load. And, and so this process is all connected. You can kind of start on either end, but you know, things have to agree in both places or uh, if you don't, you will be fighting a losing battle with physics and your building is going to, over time, sag, uh, sink into the ground, all kinds of bad things you don't want to happen. So um, I think that's a good overview of the process. You know, it's just a matter of propagating your loads through all the pieces and figuring out what size you need for each one. So at this point, let's go inside and uh, we'll get a little bit more specific with uh, paper and pen. All right, so here we are um, at my workbench and I want to step through a couple things. Um, the first thing, before we get into sizing the header beam, which is our real goal today, I just want to talk about uh, rafters. And um, the best way to do your rafters is, is either use local knowledge for, for instance, around here, based on our snow load, I know that up to about a eight foot span, I can use a two by six rafter if they're spaced two feet apart. From eight to about 12 foot span, I go up to a two by eight and so on. And, and I've got that worked out and I know that works for me uh, based on many projects. But if you don't know, you know, what, what to use in your area for rafters, you, you'll want to look for some sort of a carpentry handbook. And um, these are some pages out of a very old carpentry handbook that I have. I, I can't even find the book anymore. I think it's probably in a box somewhere, but... Uh, I, I did uh, make photocopies that I keep uh, in my shop and what it'll do is it'll give you different types of roof shapes and tell you, you know, what they consider to be the span. So it's cut off here, but for like a shed roof, like my sawmill shed, the span goes all the way across. If you're looking at a um, A-frame type of roof, really when they talk about span, they're only talking about half of that. and and. Uh, that's a big difference between the roof styles, but, um, you know, and there's Gambrel over here. That's got two different spans. But what you can do is, you know, if you know your local snow load, you know the weight of the materials on the roof, you can come to a handbook like this and um, it'll have some tables and it'll tell you, okay, based on um, the span and the strength of your wood and then the type of load on the wood, it's going to tell you you know, what size lumber you need to use for your rafter. And so, uh, again, we're not going to focus on rafters here, um, but if you don't have local information about what size rafters to use over certain spans, you know, get a carpentry handbook and it'll have all these things uh, in there that'll be real helpful. Uh, so the next thing I want to do is switch over to the computer and talk about two documents you can download online that'll be really helpful as we work towards sizing uh, the beam uh, over the, uh, the width uh, of our sawmill shed. Okay, so the first uh, document I want to I talk about, and by the way, I'll give links to all this stuff uh, down below, is um, uh, a little PDF on wood structural design data, and this is put out by, by the American Wood Council, and uh, this is going to be useful to kind of understand how uh, beams work that are made out of wood and and this is a real useful document in general if you're working with wood in a lot of different ways and I'll just step through some of the interesting uh, parts of this um, if we start on uh, page nine uh, this is a real handy table that's going to give you the weight pounds per cubic foot of a whole bunch of different type of species of wood uh, that's that's always going to come in handy 
uh, when you're sawing lumber, when you're sizing beams, um, especially if you cut a beam and you need to move it into place. I mean, I've sized beams that I later realized will be too heavy for me to move. So uh, it's good to know how much it's going to weigh and you can come back and figure that out with these properties. On uh, page 14 over here, uh, they talk about the different types of load that you get in wood. And, and this is really the one that's going to be relevant to us today. They talk about the fiber stress in uh, under bending. And uh, this is an example of a simple beam that's supported on each end with a distributed load over, over the top. When you put that load down, it's going to cause that beam to kind of bend a little bit. It's going to cause uh, compression in the upper part of the beam, tension in the lower part. It's going to create a bending stress. And that's going to form the basis of, of the calculations and some of the uh, tables that we're going to look at shortly. Um, another consideration and I'm not going to talk about this a lot today, is what type of uh, load the grain of the wood can handle. And um, that's not going to be super important today, but I, this is something I recommend you check. And basically what this, this, this comes down to is if you got a beam that's going to be sitting on posts, uh, you know, the weight of everything on that beam is going to come down and press on the posts and, you know, it's all going to be handled at the end of the beam. And you kind of want to make sure that the grain of the wood can handle that compression in that small, tiny space. And uh, there's rules of thumb for this in carpentry. You know, we know, you know, uh, for instance, uh, you can just look at the wall framing on a typical house. There are places where there are single two by four uh, wall studs. There are places where we need doubles. Um, sometimes you need doubles to support a load. Sometimes you need doubles to give proper bearing for the the header above and that's an example uh, this will be something we're not going to talk about this today but this might be something you want to consider if you're ever putting a beam and resting and on very skinny posts you need to make sure the grain of the wood isn't going to get uh, smashed in trying to support that load um, so that's something to take into account and then let's see page 26 I want to look at um, wrong one. okay there we go uh, this is kind of interesting just from a sawing standpoint. Um, it can tell you, you know, how many board feet and certain types of, of lumber. And that's, that's useful if you have to talk to somebody who speaks in lumber nomenclature. Um, I don't often do that, but uh, this is a good table that's handy for that. And it gives you some properties of, of structural lumber um, uh, that um, may, be, may be useful, again, depending on who you're talking to. Now if we jump over to page 35, this is where we start to get into the um, model, the math model of how we calculate the loads in this beam and then how we relate that to the stress in the beam. Um, if this was a metal beam, there's this very identical calculation for that that really comes down to the material property of the metal. Um, and we, we talked about some of that in a previous video about uh, tension and saw blades. We, that's going to involve um, something called Young's modulus if it's metal. When you're talking about wood, you're more interested in the fiber bending stress capability of the wood. But other than that, you know, a beam is a beam. Uh, and, and it just comes down, is it a metal material? Is it a cell cellular material like wood? You know, depending, and that, that dictates how the formulas kind of get developed from there. But uh, this is, this is going to be our starting point. We'll come back to this in a second. Um, and this is the model we're going to use. We're going to use the model of a beam that's supported on two ends. And these could be your posts. And then it has a uniform uh, uh, weight pressing down over the top over some distance L. And uh, they, they, um, th this is the kind of thing you, by the way, uh, in an engineering uh, school, you'd be covering this in your freshman or sophomore year in a engineering mechanics class. Um, it's kind of a fun class if you want to know how, how things work with beams and loads and posts and columns and uh, trusses and all that stuff. Um, <clears throat> but here they've simplified it for us just to this, this, uh, this model. Um, <clears throat> they've calculated the bending moment that occurs in that beam based on the, this load. And then they come down and they equate it 
to the fiber bending stress acting through the cross section of that beam. Uh, because really, when you load a beam up, uh, you know, if you load the beam up and nothing breaks or explodes, what that means is that the fiber stress in the wood is able to resist the load you've put in there. And so when you're doing design, you just say, well, I'm going to equate these two. And, and that's how you go forward. You say, you know, for, for this given load I'm putting on the beam, I'm going to assume the fiber bending stress can match it. And then we go from there. So we'll come back to this, uh, but this is where it's developed. Um, let's see, one other thing I want to look at, page 40. Um, we, we, when the stuff we just talked about here, we talk, we really are talking about designing for the stress in the material. There are other methods to design beams where you really focus on how much that beam is going to bend in this, or we call it deflect. Um, and you might do this deflection method if you were talking about floor joists, um, in a house with a drywall ce ceiling, because there, you know, you, you, you might be more worried about, um, you know, how much can these beams or these, these floor joists deflect and bounce without cracking the drywall. And so in some cases, people will design for deflection. Uh, we're going to design for stress, but I just wanted to mention that uh, you can design for deflection and there's a whole section on that with uh, similar formulas. And um, so eventually we will get into... Um, um, uh, the, the case I mentioned above, a simply loaded beam, and that's that's shown here. It's got two reactions. These are your posts supporting it on each end, and then a uniform load across the beam. And uh, these are the formulas we looked at up above. And this just shows some diagrams of what the shear is like and what the bending moment is like. The bending is always maximum in the middle, and so that's where we calculate to make sure uh, the fiber strength of the wood can resist that. But they have some other cases here, and this this may apply to different things you're looking at where you have different types of loads. A load that's just in the middle, um, a load that's off to one end, a little bit of load on one side, uh, some different load on the other side, a load that varies. It's not the same all the way across. It's higher over here than over here. Here's a load that gets bigger in the middle, tapers off to nothing at the ends, and, and so on. Um, this is a simple case where you have a point load right in the middle of the beam. And uh, there's just, uh, here's a point load that's not in the middle. It's off some distance from one end. And so these are just all the different scenarios you can look at for beams. There is a cookbook formula for all of them. And you really, you know, if you're not an engineer and you, you don't want to take the class, well, you really just need to come here in the cookbook, figure out which of these scenarios matches what you're trying to figure out. Uh, here's one for a beam that's stuck into a wall, cantilevered out. That's going to be useful for a lot of stuff. So, you know, you want to look through this and say, oh, yeah, that's the you know case that I'm modeling. That's the formula. And this and then you can go forward and figure out how to calculate the uh, size of the beam. So um, what I want to do now is uh, switch over to paper. We're going to go back to um, using this this simple relation here. Um, a beam supported on two ends with evenly distributed uh, load and uh, we'll pick up um, on the paper and talk about this a little bit more. Okay so here we are um, with uh, paper and pen and uh, this is this is kind of our model here. We've got a beam and, and this is this is going to be specific to my sawmill shed where I live uh, but of course you can repeat these calculations for anywhere. You just need to tune it to your local situation. Um, but I've got uh, uh, a beam that's 25 feet long. It's supported on each end with posts. I'm gonna consider these to be simple supports. So the beam's just sitting on top of them. And uh, you know, the posts go down into the ground and rest on some footer. Um, and uh, there's gonna be an evenly distributed weight on that beam coming down from the roof you know, from your rafters and from your materials and your snow load. And we're not going to get into the rafters here or, or the footings. Just let's assume, you know, you figured all that out. You've got a big enough footing to handle whatever load comes down the post in each case and not, you know, sink into the ground. And again, that depends on your soil bearing capacity. Um, and we're also going to assume, you know, you chose your rafters wisely so that 
um, they can transmit their weight from the roof above down onto this this header beam that's across the front of your your sawmill shed. Okay, so that's going to be our assumption going in. That's our model, and uh, for my my shed, it's 25 feet wide, so that's the length there. And then I've calculated a weight coming down from the materials and, and a snow load of 163 pounds per foot. And I want to talk about how I calculated that. So, um, and, and again, you can repeat this for your situation. First thing you want to do is calculate the area of your roof. And that needs to be the horizontal area. So if the roof is, is sloped, you know, figure out the area uh, under the, hor really the horizontal projection of, of, of that roof. Um, and basically, you know, if you could shine a light from above, it's going to put a shadow on the ground. That's the area of that shadow. Okay, so for my roof, um, I think I, you know, I have, I had 12 foot long roofing panels, uh, 28 feet wide, and it was a 312 pitch. And when you do all the math for that, it works out to 326 square feet of uh, horizontal area underneath that roof. And that's going to be the area that snow materials um their weight is going to act over straight down because gravity goes straight down doesn't matter if the roof is sloped it's going straight down so that's the horizontal area of that roof and then um, my combined snow and material load uh, and this was for a metal roof i'm going to assume 25 psf pounds per square foot and you know if you're having an asphalt roof you need to know what that's going to weigh you might have different snow loads in your location. You might be using different wood. It's gonna have different weights. So you need to work that out for your local situation. But for me, that works out to be about 25 uh, PSF. And so the total load on that roof, 25 PSF acting over 326 square feet. I'm just gonna do 25 times 326. And that's just over 8,000 pounds. Now, you know, unloaded, there's hard, hardly any weight on the roof. It's just the materials. But if you factor in possible snow load, you know, you could have up to 8,000 pounds on that roof for a typical um, maximum type snowfall for this area. And that's a lot of weight on the roof. And so just, you know, think about that. That's why it's so important to get this calculation right and design right. Because if you get a heavy snow... Uh, you know, you got 8,000 pounds up there. You don't want anything falling on your sawmill or people underneath it. So, you know, in this case, uh, I, I need to design the rest of my structure to hold up um, 8,150 pounds. So I'm going to assume half of that load is going to fall on the back beam of the shed. And then the other half is going to fall on the front beam. So half of that is 4,075 pounds. And um, if I take 4,075 pounds spread evenly over a 25 foot long header beam, then my unit loading is 163 pounds per foot. Okay. And so that's what I took and put in here in our model. And again, we've got posts supporting up um, that structural design data book they use v for for that force you can, you can use whatever you want but um we've got that the post of holding the beam up on each end and then we've got this combined snow material load uh putting 163 pounds per foot across a 25 foot header beam and so now our goal is going to be to figure out how big that beam needs to be okay and so we'll go back to uh, the calculation we got out of the structural design handbook. And you remember I talked about saying, well, they told us this is going to be the bending moment in the beam based on the, the, the weight per foot on it and the length of the beam. That's over here. And then over here is the, the resisting moment of the wood based on the fiber bending stress rating and then the width and the height of the beam. And we typically use B for width as in base and then H, little h for height. And so uh, again, this is saying, well, this is what you're loading the beam with. This is what it must resist, or this, this is what the grain of the wood is gonna, gonna resist with. And we just say, well, these two are equal, okay? 
if nothing's going to blow up or fall apart or crack or, or you know, uh, go, go into some catastrophic failure, then we know that the stress in the wood is able to completely resist the loads we're applying. And we equate the two to work through the math. And so what I'm going to do here, you can, you can rearrange this stuff however you want. You've, you've got some things that you know. You've got some things that you're trying to figure out. And you can rearrange this to solve for whatever is the unknown quantity in your situation. For me, what I often do is I, for a beam, I'll often say, okay, well, you know, this needs to fit on top of a certain size post. So I want the beam to be the same width as the post. So I will normally set that. I'll pick that dimension to something I know it should be or something I want it to be. And then I'll solve for the height of the beam. And that's what I've done here. And so the formula uh, we come up with is that the height of the beam in inches is going to be the square root of, of this stuff in, he, of, in here. And what we've got in here is, on the top is our, our load, pounds per foot distributed on the beam, length of the beam squared, and then down here, uh, the fiber bending stress capability of the wood times the width of the beam. Okay, and, and uh, you can plug everything in here. We know all this stuff, and that'll tell us how high that, that beam needs to be. So we'll go to that calculation here. So in this case, um, for my sawmill shed, uh, the beam was gonna be sitting on top of uh, uh, six inch posts. You know, sometimes I use four by sixes, sometimes I use six by sixes, just depends on uh, the situation. But I know, you know, uh, the, the width uh, at the top of that Post is going to be uh, five and a half inches if we use a nominal size. So that's what I'm going to set the bottom width dimension of my beam to be so that it sits nicely on my post. And here, um, this is the fiber bending stress capability of the wood. And um, for southern yellow pine, like I'm using, it's 1200 psi. Uh, and you can look this up in a, another type of handbook and let me switch back the uh, second type of document you're, you're going to want to look up and um, uh, in my case uh, I have a lot of southern yellow pine on my property I use it as a uh, post and beam and framing lumber and so I I looked up this guide from the southern pine council and it's going to give you different types of characteristics and specifications for that species of wood and you'll be able to find this kind of document for other species as well um, but in our case, in particular, what we're interested in is finding out what the fiber bending stress capability of the lumber is. And so you can see they have a table here where they give us um, many, many characteristics of the lumber. But the one we're interested in is the fiber bending stress here. And they've got some values given depending on the grade of the wood from select down through number one, number two, down, you know, construction, standard utility. And they'll also base it on the nominal size of the wood uh, because that determines you know how many defects could be inside a beam knots things like that um, and so you can look up a value here um, me personally i know that anything i'm sawing myself on from my own wood is you know as good or better than number two that i would buy in a lumber yard so i tend to use uh, the number two values uh, depending on the size of, of what I'm cutting. But if you want to be conservative, you could say, well, you know, I don't know, there could be defects. You might want to pick number three and back off a little bit, but you have that choice. Uh, and that is going to be shown in a document like this. Okay, so back to our calculation. Uh, I'm going to use a value of 1200 for the fiber bending stress. Um, that's what I'm comfortable using for, for my wood. And so from there, it's just a matter of uh, plugging into to the formula we came up before and again, you know, I, I told I told the formula basically, you know I'm going to use a five and a half inch wide beam And then I want to figure out what what the height is And so we plug our different values into the formula here and that comes out at 11.79 inches and so what that's saying is that for this load pressing down on the beam that's over a 25 foot span with simple supports on each end, um, uh, using southern yellow pine with a 
uh, this particular stress rating, uh, you know, I need a beam that's about 12 inches high. And, and that's, you know, what I would saw. Um, and you may, again, want to build in a little bit of factor of safety. People generally like to overbuild things. Um, there's no downside to it as long as you can handle the, the weight and the costs and, you know, uh, any, any other associated factors. So, you know, here I just rounded up to 12 for the heck of it. But um, if you wanted to be really, really conservative, you could bump that up to 14, you know. Uh, no harm in doing that. Uh, or you could come back and say, well, I'm going to saw my beam a true six inches wide, and you could repeat the calculation um, with six and come out with a number and, and see what it is. It, it all depends on what, you know, what size your post you're sitting on, how you want the beam to be supported. Uh, but you can use this kind of a formula process by specifying the width of the base and then come through and calculate what the height would need to be to support those loads. And so that's the process to do it uh, on paper. Uh, there's actually kind of a shortcut, and we'll come back Back over. in the uh, uh, Wood Structural Design Data um, Handbook. And uh, what they have, if you, if you go look further in that handbook uh, towards the back, they have tables where they've pre-computed uh, the formula we just went through on paper for different spans of wood and different sizes of, of, uh, of, of a beam um, based on different fiber bending stress values. And so you can see the 1200 uh, column is right here. And so you could follow that down for a 25 foot span. And based on different values of uh, little w, that was the pound per foot load on the beam. And, and in my case, it was 163 pounds per foot. Um, and I'll just keep scrolling down until I pass uh, 163 um, so here here they've got uh, uh, 6 by 12 capable of supporting uh, 155 pounds per foot when they put the values over here in this case these are nominal uh, so that's going to be a 5.5 times 11.25 true beam okay and that's that's smaller than what we came up with so we uh, a true 6 by 12 is not going to work a, a, a nominal for us um, but if we go to the next six wide, um, which would be a six by 14, you can see that can handle 213 pounds per foot. And uh, you know that tells you, hey, over the 25 foot, foot span for 1200 fiber bending, uh, 1200 PSI fiber bending stress, um, I could use a six by 14 beam. Um, nominal is gonna be uh, five and a half by, I believe 13.25, uh, don't quote me on that. Um, and so this, this table is kind of a shortcut way to go through the calculation. Just realize here they're using very nominal sizes. Um, and it may, may may not match to what you do roughs on. Or, or you know, you can say, well, for, I'll just, to be convenient, I will use nominal sizing so that I can use this table. But this is really the same thing we just went through mathematically. Uh, they've put this, I like to call this a cookbook table again, where they've done it for us. Uh, you don't even have to break out a calculator. You just need to know what your inputs are and, and come down and, you know, find the value that's going to fit. And uh, they've got this for all different spans, a range of different fiber bending stresses, different sizes of lumbers, and so on. And so you just really need to find the, you know, that, that square in the table that matches your situation. And it's going to give you the same information that uh, that math formula uh, did that that we just went through okay so that's going to wrap things up i uh, hope this has been uh, useful to you and i just want to kind of recap really quickly what we went through uh, so you know the first thing we did was look at the beam equations in that uh, design handbook and uh, you know the, the the whole thing the key to remember here is we're looking at the input loads that cause that beam to want to bend and then we're looking at the resisting capability of the beam based on its fiber bending stress uh, capability and then the cross-sectional size of the beam and that's really the, the balance you're, you're, you're setting up to work through the math here and in this case we solved it for the height of the beam and so this is a case where I'll say hey I know I want a certain width beam what is the height need to be all right and um, 
then we kind of worked over to the case that was specific to my sawmill shed, 25 foot span, 163 pound per foot load across it, two posts, uh, one on each end. And again, to get the, the load in that beam, I just wanted to know the horizontal projection of the roof area, the combined snow material load that gave us the total load on the roof. We then said, okay, half of it's gonna sit on each header beam. Header beam is 25 foot long and that gave us the 163 pounds per foot that we came and took and plugged in and worked through the math. I said, okay, I want a five and a half inch wide uh, beam to sit on top of my posts. I know the fiber bending stress worked through and that said, okay, you know, you're gonna need about a 12 inch high beam to handle these loads with Southern yellow pine. And, and so it's as simple as that. And again, if you want to add a factor safety to this to overbuild it a little, typically, you know, bump it up by, uh, you know, 20%. That's a good all around level. Or, you know, in this case, it could bump it up to, uh, you know, 14 inches and, and, and you should be uh, in good shape. If you don't want to work through the math uh, for the, uh, the beam formula and, and solve that way, uh, you know, I showed how you can go to the uh, back half of that handbook, look up your span, go down the right column based on your fiber bending stress capability of your wood, uh, look for the box that matches um, or exceeds the load you're putting on the beam and then you come over and it'll tell you, you know, what, what size uh, beam you need to use to handle that load. So there's a couple ways you can do this. Um, some people really like the math. You could even set up a spreadsheet and work through different sizes. Some people like to use the cookbook. Either way, you know, you're gonna get the same answer uh, from both of these. Just remember a lot of these cookbooks, when they size their lumber, these are nominal dimensions. And so you have to take that into account. But uh, yeah, that's gonna wrap things up for today. I hope this has been helpful and thanks for watching.